we'll probably have some stragglers coming in. Um, the president will be here towards the end to join us for our reception. So when we finish at five, I hope you um, will stick around and, and uh, socialize with us for a little while. This is the kickoff for our R2 um, initiative. So as you know, um, a letter was sent out from my office um, maybe a month ago, two weeks, I don't know, I have no sense of time. September 19th, uh, there was an, a, um, a letter from my office that was sent out to, through the deans to the faculty to talk about the some research themes that have started to bubble up from the roadmap process. And those themes um, are pretty broad in scope, as you saw, and they are safe and sustainable communities, biomedical and health services, human development and well-being, and computing and technologies, technology. And so around those themes, we're starting to launch many events um, university-wide to help faculty and students engage in research, and we're really excited about these events. Um, so if you probably saw earlier this week or last week that the FLCs have launched um, four topics related to these four themes that I just talked about. We have research networking events. We have two this semester and two next semester, and, and one of the yellow cards on your table will give you the dates for those uh, networking events, and again, they're uh, by theme. Um, we have not sent this out yet for my office, but it's probably coming later this week or next week around um, expansion of undergraduate research opportunities for carrots and ERCAs around the themes. Um, we have mentoring opportunities uh, where we will be providing some um, uh, funding to faculty to serve in mentoring roles and to really start establishing, a, you know, formal mentoring mentee relationships. We're doing a lot of mentoring from my office right now. I think some of you are benefiting from that, but we'd like to engage other, um, you know, strong researchers around campus to assist. Um, and finally, we have another opportunity coming from my office in uh, conjunction with the library where we will have a subvention fund funding, which means if you're wanting to publish in open access journals or you're publishing a book, uh, we'll uh, help defray some of those fees. And then most importantly, or not most importantly, but in terms of dollar amount, we have the iCubed initiative, the innovative interdisciplinary initiative, which we will be um, providing the um, calls for proposals in November. Uh, applications will be due in April and selection of teams will be in May. This is where we will be funding interdisciplinary teams, um, at least four teams based on the four themes or more uh, teams of faculty and students engaged in research. And we're very, very excited about um, taking some of our, frankly, scarce resources and really trying to light a fire under the research enterprise here at KSU. Um, we're just moving a mile a minute if you haven't, if you haven't noticed. Uh, we've got events running pretty much every week, and I'm super excited um, for the kickoff um, to include this great programming that we have today. So let me introduce you uh, to you, Ed Coyle, um, and also his colleague, Kitty Vogt, who's sitting right here. Um, Kitty and Ed are part of the Vertically Integrated Projects Program, um, which Ed helped to found. Uh, uh, he's the director of the VIP Consortium, which is a consortium of universities who are implementing the, um, the VIP, which he will tell us about today. Um, Ed is also a Georgia Research Alliance eminent scholar. Um, he's a faculty member at Georgia Tech, where uh, I could go on and on and on about your bio, but I think they'd rather hear from you. Um, so we're super delighted for them to be here today, and let's give him and Kitty a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Is that a little too loud? <laughs> okay. Just right? All right. Um, so what we want to talk about is the Vertically Integrated Projects Program. And uh, the goal of this program from the beginning has been to enable everybody on campus to work together. And by everybody, I really mean everybody. The undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, you know, faculty, research staff. Uh, and even the different organizations that are on campus that are sometimes involved in the, in the various projects that we'll talk about. So it's a way of, you know, if you're doing research, it's a scalable way to include the undergraduates in what you're doing. So just because you're becoming a, a research intensive unit doesn't mean you have to give up uh, your interaction with your undergraduates. In fact, it's an opportunity to work even closer with them. Okay, so enabling everybody to work together. Keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, oh, that's curious. Uh, so the goal is to involve everyone in scholarship and exploration 
And I purposely use those terms instead of research and education because both research and education are kind of loaded terms nowadays. Um, and scholarship does a nice job of sort of covering what you're trying to do, where you're trying to develop deep knowledge and expertise in a certain area. And you're also trying to help uh, your undergraduates and your graduate students to also develop that deep knowledge and expertise. And then exploration is a better way of thinking about what research is. Well, as research you know, tends to be thought of as some you know, very high level thing, uh, but research uh, can happen on many different levels. And if we think of it as exploration, then it takes a lot of the uh, biases out of what uh, uh, the term research brings. So they could be acts of discovery, design, creativity, innovation, um, research in one or more fields. Uh, and finally, both of these things are present in every academic discipline. And that's what's really unique about this program is that it's actually a campus-wide program. So it's not just, say, engineering or science or arts or humanities. It's everything all rolled into one and it enables people to cross disciplinary boundaries. I'm not quite sure why my uh, images are missing. Let's see if they're displaying right up here. Uh, actually, they're missing in the presentation after you down after you made a copy of it. Let me try opening it again. They're there now, uh, but they're not on the slide. Okay, I'm going to close this and try to reopen it. Ah, there we go. When in doubt, shut it down and restart it, right? <laughs> Let's see if it shows up when I put it in presentation mode. Perfect. <laughs> so, you know, presentations have gotten to be so complicated, you know, thousands of dollars of laptop and projectors and everything else, and it all has to work right. <laughs> um, okay, so well, that's where we were. And, uh, in trying to enable everybody to work together, we found out this is structured as universities that gets in the way. Um, and we call them the three forms of fragmentation. Uh, the one that really affects the undergraduates uh, is the fragmentation by time. You know, their experience on campus is chopped up into semesters and academic years. So it's very difficult for them to have one thread of experience that goes through their entire time on campus. Uh, and then for faculty, uh, your time is divided up between you know, sort of your teaching duties or teaching load, uh, whatever your research activities might be, whatever your outreach and service activities might be. So typically people are wearing, you know, one hat or the other at any given time here. It's very difficult to integrate them. And then finally, there's the one we all know about because every single one of us is a member of some department, <laughs> right? So everything is divided up by discipline. Uh, it comes down to culture and even uh, the way people supposedly think. Scientists think differently than engineers, think differently than artists, uh, and so on. And uh, that's really unfortunate because it really shouldn't be that way. So uh, the history of this program is really the history of overcoming each one of these forms of fragmentation one at a time. So the first thing we did in 1995, yes, this is a 23-year-old program, uh, 24 years now, um, was with what we call now VIP 1.0, was engineering projects and community service. You know, I'm an engineer, uh, along with a, a fellow engineer, Leah Jameson, we started this program in 95. And we created the first vertically integrated teams. They had freshmen through seniors on every single team. And a big teams, average team size of around 16. And they actually tackled really neat technology-based projects for uh, local community service organizations. Because they're actually facing the situation where they have to have new technology to improve their services or to offer new ones. And what we learned from that was that when you organize the students well 
and you don't pay attention to time boundaries and disciplinary boundaries, they can really do great things. The problem with that one was maintaining the advisors, the faculty advisors, uh, because they were not getting any credit for advising the teams. They weren't getting teaching credit, and it also wasn't uh, contributing to anything that would help them get uh, you know, tenure promotion and, and pay increases. So in 2001, uh, we decided to change to uh, VIP, officially called Vertically Integrated Projects. So we intentionally dropped the engineering because we didn't think we needed it. And we wanted to encourage other disciplines. And then we tried, by, tried to embed the, the teams in faculty research efforts, or let's call it exploration efforts. So it's not focused just on certain types of research. And uh, so we tried that for five or six years just to see how well it worked. And once again, the teams proved themselves that they could actually do really neat things in support of uh, you know, exploration activities in a wide, wide, wide variety of fields. Uh, so then, uh, our focus was on you know, why are we limited to just ECE now, or engineering. So I moved to Georgia Tech in 2008, and the goal, the hypothesis, was the VIP should work in every discipline. And uh, so we started it up that way. So now VIP 3.0 is vertically integrated teams all the way from uh, sophomores up through postdocs, if you have postdocs and faculty on every single team, and open to multidisciplinary projects. And as you'll see later, every single one of our projects is actually now multidisciplinary, and we have 77 of them. Okay, so VIP allows students the time to get to know each other, to figure out how to work on the project and to contribute and lead part of it. Uh, they work with the faculty and graduate students sometimes from different disciplines, so that's a really compelling context. Everybody on the team is interested in the same thing. And because of that, you get this great mentoring structure within the team. So you really need to think of each team as a small community where everybody shares the same passion uh, about a common project. Oh. <laughs> a little too far away. Okay, so this is really all it does, but it took us a while to get there. <laughs> and now that we figured out how to do that, our goal is to enable everybody else, every other institution that would like to do this, uh, to do it easily. Uh, so here are the basics. Uh, sorry for having words on PowerPoint slides. I know you're not supposed to do that, but there's no way around it. So we create projects at the request of faculty and research scientists and research staff on campus. The teams are embedded in their uh, activities. Uh, we don't create teams for companies. We don't create teams for special initiatives. It has to be a faculty member coming forward and asking to have a team. The teams are large, uh, 10 to 20 typically. At Georgia Tech, the average size is 16 students per team. And that includes the new ones, which usually start out small, 6 to 10 students. Our biggest team has uh, 65 students. Um, every team has second through final year undergraduates, and if you have graduate students, they have graduate students on them. Uh, Long-term participation. Each student earns academic credit and is graded, A, B, C, D, F, every semester that they're on your team, and they get explicit mentoring feedback from, uh, from the team advisors each semester. Um, and they can do that for up to three years. The new students replace those who graduate each semester or otherwise leave the team. So the team keeps rolling forward semester to semester and year to year. So there's always a core of knowledge in the, within the team that stays there permanently. And the benefit of that to you is the returning students each semester are the ones who train the new students who join. So once you have your team spun up to speed, it just kind of runs by itself after that as long as you're making sure the process works. And uh, students are drawn from all disciplines requested by the advisors. Teams continue for many years. And again, academic credit and grades each semester. So just to drive home the size of these teams, this is a photo of my team from about five, six years ago. And uh, these are my graduate students on the right here. And then all the rest were undergrads. And there were actually four undergrads who weren't there that day. So my team typically has 20 to 25 undergrads. And what we do, um, you know, I'm an electrical and computer engineer, uh, so we actually uh, use the Georgia Tech football stadium as a giant test bed for communications and sensing um, and fan infotainment. And so 
when you create your VIP project, be ambitious. Think about what you could do if you all of a sudden had you know, at least 16 undergraduates that could work with you. It can really amplify what you do. So we work very closely with athletics. We have three sophisticated systems in the stadium that do things like uh, provide entertainment for the fans, sense how the stadium shakes, monitor the RF spectrum to see how efficiently it's being used, and develop new algorithms for that. And so if you have spare time sometime, I can tell you exactly what the undergrads on the team are doing and exactly what the masters and PhD students are doing. So I won't spend too much time talking about my particular team. I think it'd be better to, uh, well, I'll show you one part of it. This is the fun part. <laughs> so we actually have some sensor nodes out there that sense how the stadium shakes, and we collect that data. And the first time we did it was a Miami-Georgia Tech game. Georgia Tech lost. Um, unfortunately, too common. <laughs> and uh, this was the data we saw. So acceleration in G's on the left, beginning of the game to about the middle of the third quarter. And what we realized uh, as the data was coming in is that we could tell what was happening in the game. You know, when teams scored, when there was a Budweiser ad on the stands you know, that got people bouncing up and down, um, when halftime started. <laughs> so we now incorporate that in all the information we deliver to fans so they know which plays are the most popular plays. Okay, but now what I want to show you is uh, the wide variety of teams. In spring 2019, we had 70 teams. We have 77 now. And so this is our, how we advertise teams to students. And what we also find is that uh, uh, companies shop this list to find teams that they want to fund and partner with. So uh, we have teams from the humanities, building for equity and sustainability. Global social entrepreneurship is from international affairs. Uh, living building science. Biology and chemistry of a brand new building on campus, which is meant to be ultra green and sustainable. Uh, low cost aerial autonomy. Uh, this one's kind of cool, a robot collective. Robots that collaborate to do certain things like make bridges or to build things. Uh, another humanities team, 21st Century Global Atlanta. Um, these two are material science teams um, studying uh, ways of creating new materials. We have a bunch of robotics teams. Um, this is a really neat one, art and artificial intelligence, trying to teach machines how to create art. Augmented reality, here's a biology team. Uh, studying bees on the Georgia Tech campus and around Atlanta. Um, brain trauma assessment protocols, actually neuroscience and electrical and computer engineering speech analysis to record people's speech and diagnose uh, brain traumas. Uh, chemistry team, um, smart cities team. Um, so I think you get the idea. Uh, this one is cool. This is a philosophy team. I never expected to have a philosophy team. <laughs> Uh, what they do is study how people argue with each other on the web. <clears throat> and they're trying to design new uh, social media that prevent the rock throwing that you see nowadays on the web. Um, and uh, everything all the way down to uh, uh, well-being and mental health on campus. Uh, this is my team, the one that works in the stadium. And to have a team, what you do, uh, we'll go back to, I like showing the B-SNAP team. Uh, we send out a template, you describe what the goals of your team are, what the issues are involved, uh, methods and technologies, and then we ask you to specify the majors from which you would like to draw students. So this team picks students from architecture, uh, city and regional planning, civil engineering to study the built environment and their impact on bees, biologists to study bees, uh, engineers and computer scientists to actually instrument beehives and to collect data from around campus and uh, mathematicians who actually develop uh, birth death models for bees and hives. So think very broadly in terms of what you could do uh, once you have a team like this. And are there any questions at this point about this? Yes.
Okay, so let me skip to, these are the courses that support the program. And we actually have our own subject code now. And uh, so it's one or two credits per semester and they receive a grade each semester. And then depending on the department, those credits count for something towards their major, towards their degree. And Well, no, what we do is we create these courses. These are university-wide, and then each department decides how uh, the credits that their students earn count towards their degree. So that's a department-by-department -department decision. And yes, it takes time. But the nice thing about it is there are examples now. There are examples now of this at 36 universities. So we Yeah, no, I'm, I, I think it's really cool. Yeah. I want to do it. It, okay. Right. I, I'm doing something <laughs> similar to this, but we don't start with freshmen. I'd like to, and here's my problem. As of a week and a half ago, anybody remember? If, if you have a course that is not directly in the major, it can no longer be, you can't use financial aid for it. So I'm struggling to figure out how to pay for my students to take my courses that they used to get minor credit for. Okay. And now... I am just wondering if this has hit y'all at all, well, or if like all of these are integrated into majors. So that's the first I've heard about this, but again, each major decides how these credits count for their students. So uh, for example, and I'll show you one of the credit use policies. <clears throat> and there is a for pay option, that's the zero credits. And there's also a way for graduate students to participate and earn credits towards their master's degrees. Um, Let's see, credit use policies. Okay, so this is how they count in two departments at Georgia Tech. So things actually flip depending on how many credits they have. So if they've only taken five credits of VIP, which is typically uh, three semesters, then they only count as free elective credits. If they, as soon as they take the sixth or more, depending on which department they're in, they become disciplinary electives. So. Uh, in BME, all six become uh, BME electives. And then it, in the senior year, it can also count for your senior capstone experience, whether it's senior design or senior thesis. So, any other questions? <laughs> okay, so if we back up here, um, So this is our enrollment history at Georgia Tech. Uh, you'll notice we flattened out for a while because we had to develop some software tools that you are all welcome to have to enable the thing to scale. And so this last semester, this spring 2019, uh, we had 1,100 students enrolled. That translates to about 1,800 to 2,000 students per year in an undergraduate population of 15,000 students. And we think long term, instead of just 77 teams, we should be able to have three or 400 teams. And this is my favorite slide because each one of these bars, each one of these vertical bars is a VIP team. The height of the bar is the number of students on the team. So you'll see that semester our biggest team had 53 students on it. And then the colors are actually the disciplines of the students on each team. And so the students we found out, they don't care about disciplinary boundaries. If you're doing a cool project and they think they can contribute, they will apply to join your project team. So it's only administrators and some faculty who care about disciplines. <laughs> um, and those are all the disciplines. There are so many now that you can't really tell the colors apart anymore. Um, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> Oops. This sometimes works, sometimes this. <clears throat> uh, longevity of teams. My team is uh, uh, 18 years old. We do have the power to shut down teams that are not functioning well. Faculty do retire, they move to other institutions, so not all teams uh, last forever, and we have ways of transitioning students to new teams. Um, this is where our advisors come from, at least at Georgia Tech, which is 70% you know, of our students are STEM students. Um, so there's a heavy bias towards computing, science, and engineering, but we're getting increasing participation from liberal arts. Um, VIP enrollment by major. Again, we started in computing and engineering but the other parts are growing. Uh, credit structure again. And this is the grading process. This is usually where I get a lot of questions. <laughs> so
So uh, the student's grade depends on three things. Documentation, so that each, per, each student is required to maintain a journal about what they do. Uh, they're supposed to uh, contribute to the team repository of knowledge, which is the wiki. It's software, it's a software repository. Presentations, reports, all on the wiki. And what we tell them is if they didn't document it, then they didn't do it. And so because of that and because we hold them to that, uh, we've never had a great appeal in 23 years. Um, then there are the individual contributions. Uh, so these are judged by you and if you have some graduate students that are working with you and the team, uh, you're the best judge of that because you're the expert in the field. And then finally, teamwork. You know, how well is the team functioning? You know, is the leadership of the team functioning well? Or are they bringing new students up to speed uh, the way they should be and so forth? And there's software behind all this to make it easy. Um, so each row here is a student. And uh, so when you first log in, you see all of your students. You can tell how many credits they're taking, what major they are, how many semesters they've been on the team so far. Okay. You know, here's a student five semesters, three semesters, two semesters. And, uh, and then if you clicked on this, you'd see the contributions by that student that semester to the wiki. And then you can see peer evaluations of them. And then there's a grading form that you complete. Um, we're simplifying this right now because there are a lot of categories here that are highly correlated with each other. Um, and this is really your judgment of how well the students are doing. And, then they, and this happens twice a semester, mid-semester and end of semester. And then both times you give them personalized feedback. Uh, this was actually for the student who's, who'd been on the team for five semesters already and was struggling a little bit with uh, leadership of uh, part, of this, part of the team. So I can let you read that for a second. And what's neat is we have all of this data going back eight years. So for each student, you can go back on your team, you can go back you know, one, two, three, four, five semesters and really see how they've grown on your team. And the fun part is you really get to know the students well and they get to know you well. Um, and then the peer evaluations, I won't go too much into these. This is important to make sure what's happening in the team is what you think is happening in the team based on student input. And finally, um, let's see, let's talk about faculty credit. <laughs> uh, we've seen three things at Georgia Tech. It's different from department to department. On uh, some departments, you don't get any course release time for having your VIP team. So the reward to you is the research that you know, your team can accomplish with you. Um, in my department, probably because I'm there, uh, you get credit for one course a year for each year that you have your VIP team. And that actually works out well in terms of the number of students that you contact each year. Um, and uh, also in terms of time. Because in terms of time, it takes me about half of the equivalent of teaching a regular course to advise my team. And then finally, what I think is a beautiful compromise is it's really the first year or two where you're spinning your team up to speed that you spend a lot of work educating them or actually helping them learn. You don't lecture to them. You give them things to read and you have them present back to the team. Um, and so you get released from one course a year for the first two years you have your team and after that if the team's functioning well you have the research benefits. And that allows the department to launch a specified number of new VIP teams each year to avoid busting the teaching budget. And what's really great about this, um, well, first of all, here's a little bit of the evaluation data. This is the only program we know of that really allows people to work together from different disciplines. And it also really allows people to work together from uh, diverse backgrounds. Because of the way we do admissions, we don't screen by GPA, we don't screen by interviews, and you don't screen by prerequisites because we found none of those are correlated with performance on a team. The only thing that matters is their enthusiasm for the project. So some of your students that have low GPAs for whatever reason, they may end up being the best student on your project. So you definitely don't screen them out. <clears throat> and so here are some of the benefits for the students. Um, really cool projects. They want to do something other than just sit in classes while they're here or, or, or do structured labs. So this is a great opportunity for them. And they get to know graduate students and faculty and really figure out you know, what are the cutting edge things in their field. Um, 
and it provides a compelling reason to be on campus because you're working with people from dis different disciplines and the only places on earth where you have all, all disciplines represented are university campuses. Uh, benefits for faculty, much better organized, much more effective undergrad research. Uh, the peer leadership and peer management, uh, peer mentoring that takes place within the VIP team actually makes it much more efficient uh, to run the team from your perspective. And, um, and again, it's actually great recruiting for graduate school. <laughs> uh, two, of my th yeah, two of my current graduate students actually came up through my VIP team. And they're, cur and they're still involved with the team. And for universities, this is, I think, the best way to be a research-intensive university, <laughs> is to realize that you, know, you have thousands and thousands of undergrads out there. You know, they're young, they're energetic, they're bright, they want to do something. So open up your uh, research doors and let them in and uh, work with them. And I think what we're really happy to see is that this program is, is spreading just on its own merits um, to a wide variety of universities. Uh, so 25 in the US, 11 around the world, and uh, with more pending. And I think once we reach 50 or so, pretty much everybody's going to want to do this. Because uh, we've tested it out in so many different environments that you know, for school of a certain type, if you wonder how VIP works there, we can show you a place where it works well. Uh, for example, we were discussing earlier that Boise State is one of your peer institutions, and we can take a look at the, the teams that are underway there. And there are faculty are using it a little differently than they use it at Georgia Tech, uh, but it still works really well. Um, some people are using it to restart research in particular areas, and other people are using it to explore scholarly things that uh, they hadn't been able to before. And uh, we meet once a year directors and usually one faculty member from every VIP site to talk about VIP, talk about common problems, identify papers and research we might want to do, proposals we want to write, um, and it's a lot of fun. And so you can be a VIP program. It's free to be a member of the VIP consortium. There's no fee. <laughs> the only thing we ask is that you actually be running a VIP program, which means the teams are vertically integrated uh, the projects are embedded in your faculty and your research staff's uh, efforts. Um, they should be large-scale, ambitious projects that last for years. If it's something that's only going to be a semester or two, it's not a VIP project. Um, it has to be curricular. All students have to be graded. Um, and there should be incentives built into the curriculum for them to participate for at least two years. Because that's when they learn the most, and that's when you benefit the most. And so the consortium, if you join the consortium, the whole point is for all of us to work together to improve VIP and to help every site succeed. And so we ask everybody to share what they can. And if they need something, then the whole consortium helps out. And so I always end this presentation with a question, usually when I'm going around to different departments. And I like people to think about what they could do if they had a VIP team uh, that worked with them. So unless there are questions, any more questions? Yes, maybe. So um, I've asked you a lot of questions. I've asked you a lot of questions already. Um, but one that I did not ask earlier was around the space. Does Georgia Tech provide common space for teams to meet? And what, what does that look like? So, uh, so we have three rooms that are dedicated to VIP meeting space. And they're typically used by the teams that are really big because you can't find a conference room or, or something else that can fit a team of uh, you know, 60 students all at once. And, uh, but most of the other teams, they can find a conference room in a building they're in and they just reserve that for that same time slot every week. Um, or their lab is big enough that they can meet inside their lab. Uh, so that, so the three rooms that we have supports uh, 77 teams. So it's not super space intensive, but you do need space for big teams to meet. Yeah. Chris? Yeah. All right. 
Uh, thank you. Earlier you mentioned that uh, companies would sort of peruse the available teams and use that to kind of gain interest on projects they're into. Can you speak to how effective this program has been at actually bringing external funds into the university through initiating these teams and having them uh, advertised as they are? Sure. Um, so pay attention to how you advertise. Uh, we've kind of learned over the years uh, what's really effective, and this is really effective. So when somebody asks to have a team, we tell them, give us a compelling icon uh, that can represent your team. Give us a short, sweet title and describe it in a way that undergraduates can understand it and that people from companies and other organizations can understand it. So if you browse this page, you, you'll see lots of examples of that in action. And uh, recently we found out that companies have found, about, have found out about uh, VIP pages at different universities, and they browse these teams. <clears throat> And so what they're doing is they're looking for a team that's working in their area. Um, so Harris Corporation does a lot of uh, DOD defense communications and they found my team which does stuff that's related to what they're doing. And so we got in contact with them and they're now supporting the team financially. Initially with the industrial affiliates program we started which is a way to get your team fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year that comes in unrestricted and with no deliverables. And for me, that actually evolved into a research grant uh, that's funding uh, a couple of my PhD students. Um, and so we've had a number of companies do that. Cisco, Harris, Sandia National Labs. Uh, I'm missing, I know I'm missing something. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a list and it's growing. Um, and this is really good because they're interested in this for recruiting purposes. They want to meet students in their sophomore year who are interested in their stuff. They want to offer them internships and then they offer them internships after their junior year. And it's nothing like having a student who's on your team going away and having an internship experience relevant to your team and then coming back and knowing even more than they did when they left. Uh, so it's very nice partnerships. The other thing that happens is for NSF grants you know, that have required education and broader impact components or DOD grants that require workforce development components, People are writing their VIP teams into their grant and requesting funds to support the activities of their team. So VIP teams have been written into at least 25 different proposals in the last uh, two or three years um, at Georgia Tech. So it, it helps, helps it get funded. Hi, I'm curious about any differences that you've seen in either teams at Georgia Tech that are almost exclusively undergraduates or primarily undergraduate institutions, if there's any differences in those teams. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's often a difference in sort of the, you know, the, the, the type of research or level of research that's done in different places. So Georgia Tech teams look a little different than, uh, say, Boise State teams. And, you know, but as long as it's something that's innovative and, uh, moves the faculty members' uh, interest in scholarship and research forward, that's fine. And I have the, I think I still have the Boise State site up here. Um, so these are, so Boise State, I think they recently became an R2 institution. Um, and uh, so these are how they list their teams, um, Pathways Open Resources. They have 21 teams now. And actually, any time the VIP site crosses 20, we consider that to be a truly mature uh, VIP site on the way to scaling up for all of campus. So fostering a culture of kindness in rural schools, um, shared stories, um, not sure, what, virtual reality with scent, that sounds interesting, or I should say it smells interesting. Um, uh, audio signal processing, autonomous robots, bioinnovation, humanitarian engineering and social entrepreneurship. Um, so the only thing we really care about is that it's moving something that the faculty members are interested in moving that forward. Some of the folks at Boise State have used VIP to help restart their research, their funded research, because the team is free. Um, as long as you don't need a lot of expensive equipment, you can start gathering some data and some preliminary results that you can put in proposals. So, yes. Thanks. So um, I love the idea, and if we're ground floor, is it better to start something like this with your existing infrastructure, with the courses in place and the, the model in place, 
and then start building teams, or is it better to, on your own time, find interested students and an interested faculty member and put a group together and, and grow sort of like you did in the early days? Right, and so a lot of the initial sites did develop, you know, sort of from the ground up, and then you, you cobble together various things that count for different things. Uh, it's certainly much easier if you have that kind of the set of courses that we have, um, but it depends on how quickly you think you could implement them. Yeah. You, know, you can start VIP without having those, but if you have them, everything else is so much easier. Because okay. the nice thing for us is, you know, as an advisor for my team, my team is section VP3 of every single one of those courses, and so they all show up in the course management system, which makes it easy for me to do all sorts of things. Um, so. Kind of depends on how nimble you think your campus is at creating something like this. At least there are examples to point to. So we had to do this all the way from scratch. And uh, it was, uh, I guess, after six years, seven years at Georgia Tech that we finally got that in place. Um, and you can have our course descriptions, you know, because you're in, in Georgia, a lot's going to be the same. So uh, you can look at how we've done things and the paperwork and all that. Uh, so it could potentially go very quickly here. Um, but if it doesn't, you can still start teams anytime and uh, you know, figure out how to count because you'll find that the students will do it anyway um, and the faculty will do it anyway. There are always a few people really interested in this, crazy enough to do it if you want to call it that. <laughs> and there are probably people already doing it um, that uh, have been sort of ad hocing teams like this. But this, plus the size, plus the grading um, tools, make it really easy to run your team. And any of the software that we have, that you know, you're welcome to have. In fact, at the uh, VIP site at Stony Brook, because our stuff is so mature now, it reaches into all the systems on campus. You know, registrar's database and other databases on campus. Uh, but there are some lighter weight tools that Stony Brook has developed for new VIP sites. So for advertising teams, you know, assigning students to teams, things like that. So for universities that are just starting out, what kind of support do you provide as the consortium? Um, I guess encouragement, software, <laughs> uh, models. Um, for a while, we had a grant from Helmsley that allowed us to provide seed funds to new sites. So we started up about, there were five original VIP sites and then we had um, about 13 more that were seeded by a $5 million grant from Helmsley. And we were intentionally looking for universities of different types. Uh, ever since then, all the others have joined uh, on their own dime. Uh, we're perfectly happy to write proposals with people. Um, in fact, the, the whole program that we've run starting at Georgia Tech through, uh, I mean, at Purdue through Georgia Tech has all been done with external funding. Because um, basically, we, we wanted to prove it would work and then ask the university to institutionalize it. So you don't have to go through that step. Uh, but yes, it might be nice to have some resources for probably release time for whoever is going to be the, the director of your VIP program. Because that's a pretty in, intense job in the beginning, trying to get all the courses in place, you know, visiting all the different committees, uh, vetting the teams, overseeing the recruiting process. So the most important thing is establishing your uh, the director of your VIP site. And ideally, that's uh, somebody who has their own VIP team. So they're living the, living the experience. Yes? So you indicated um, in terms of how to proceed, take baby steps. Um, even before a VIP program is started, is there any wisdom in identifying a corporate partner or a nonprofit partner who has an issue that requires interdisciplinary teams? And get an RFP, a reverse RFP from them. What is the issue? Bring the issue to us. Mm -hmm. We construct the team. Give us a year to construct the team, the curriculum. It may not have all the seven components, but you know, piecemeal that and take a year and, and pilot that before? Um, I mean, has anybody done something like this? Uh, the VIP sites that have taken that approach, and this is one reason to have the consortium, we can see different approaches and right. see how well they work. That does not work well. Okay. And the reason it does not work well is actually the characteristics of industry. And so they may come and say, we would really like to have a VIP team formed around this topic. Right. And then the VIP director is left with the task of finding some Got it. 
some faculty member who's interested in doing that. And then the company's offering some resources, so you're not necessarily getting a faculty member that's really passionate about that topic, but just yes. wants the resources. Yes. Uh, so these are lessons learned the hard Absolutely. way. Absolutely. So you. the one site that did that never got beyond 18s. Was one day. Thank you. So you only started at the request of a faculty member. Anybody else? These are great questions, by the way. <laughs> I have two questions, and one may be more of an observation than a question. Okay. When you're working with these multidisciplinary teams, are you exclusively defining the players as campus players? Or can you have members of the team that are external to you, for example, government, for-profit, non-profit representatives, so that way they also have buy-in to reciprocate the work that needs to be done. They may get credit and benefits in different ways, but sure. when I was looking at them, I didn't see explicitly that non-faculty staff at an institution are coupled with people who have expertise in the industry, so that way there is a quid pro quo. Okay, so uh, this is really a question about who, who the partners can be of, of VIP teams, and sometimes it's it's Somebody from a partner institution could be, for us, it's like CDC or Grady or Smith Gall or the Atlanta Zoo. Um, they might not necessarily be listed as advisors for the team. They're project partners, and you meet with them you know, once or twice a semester to get their input on the project. You know, maybe you're deploying something at their site, and they're using it, and they'll be giving you feedback. So in light of that, what do you need to do to get IRB both at the institution but also within the agency partners that you're working with? Is it the same that you would do normally, or are there other protocols because of this nature? Well, it depends on the project, uh, whether it needs IRB approval or not, um, and that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, one of the things we learned uh, with EPICS, Engineering Projects and Community Service, because we would be, the teams would be making things that might be used by, say, young children who have disabilities. And uh, the agreement we had with the community service agency is that they would give us advice and interact as we're building this. We would turn whatever it was over to them, and it was their decision whether to allow uh, their young clients to use it. And so the, the risk was assumed by the, the nonprofit, not by uh, Purdue University in that case. And then, like I said, question, comment, possible hybrid, and then now is another question. If we already have a team that's in place, okay. but we don't have the infrastructure institutionally to give us additional supports, but we're at the turning point, like literally at the tipping point to actually create a consulting firm and charge members of the community to do the work that we do to subsidize students for their tuition, give them stipends, how does that vertically integrate with your existing model to that make it entrepreneurial innovative, but also something that the students see a reward beyond just their classroom learning, but they can make it an enterprise that they can take into the world of work. Okay. Um, I think this is something between what I, okay, what we typically see is teams that are you know, doing research. Uh, a lot of times we've seen uh, teams spin off companies uh, that has to follow whatever procedure your university has for, for handling spin offs and managing conflicts of interest. If it's something that they're doing where they're actually earning income from outside, I don't think I've seen that yet. Okay. So that would be interesting to see how that works. Sure. Thank you. So you mentioned in passing that you're increasingly seeing people from the liberal arts participate. Yes. I'm, I'm guessing I'm one of the few people from humanities here. <laughs> and my department is already very interdisciplinary. But, but I'm curious if your institution or maybe other institutions in the consortium have made any particular efforts to involve people from the humanities in these projects. Because I think scientists and engineers are much more used to working in teams. That's a yes. natural thing to do. And, and so that's what, that's what has been interesting because I, I had always, the intent when I joined Georgia Tech was to have everybody involved. So I met many times with the leadership of the Ivan Allen College, uh, which is sort of everything there. You know, it's literature, media, communications, public policy, international affairs. And, uh, and we had that discussion. 
you know, typically, typical mode of operation for a faculty member is, you know, you produce a book every three or four years, uh, or maybe write some literary criticism. Um, and they weren't quite sure how VIP would work. And this is actually where another VIP site came in very handy. Uh, the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, they were actually the first site to have humanities teams. And one of their teams was Text Lab. So it was computer scientists and English majors, and they were actually doing analysis of various English texts. And, uh, and they had, an, uh, it was a theater and community team, and I can't remember the, the two others. So what we did was we actually set up a Skype session where the advisors for those teams talked with the leadership of Ivan Allen. And at the end, they said, yes, it looks like this will work. So then they kind of said, OK, who wants to try this? And we're now finding some people stepping forward to do it. Uh, and it's a challenge there because of the high teaching loads. Uh, but uh, we have a number of teams that are, that are up and running. What I was really happy to see, this last week I was actually over in Scotland again. Uh, University of St. Andrews is starting up VIP. And unlike every other VIP site, which started in either engineering or science, they're starting in the humanities. So, but yes, it took a while to talk with them about how you would work with a group like this. And um, uh, so after lots of discussions with them, they figured out some, some really neat things that they could do. But they see it as changing the, changing the mode of operation from sort of the individual uh, to uh, group work. So yes, we absolutely want people from the humanities involved. <laughs> Thank you. That's very encouraging. <laughs> Anybody else? And we're only half an hour away. So if you ever want to visit us and if you want to sit on one of the teams that you're interested in, you know, find the advisor, send them some email, and come and visit us. Uh, okay, can we give our presenter a round of applause? That was wonderful. Thanks. So um, they will be staying around for a little while. We have adult beverages and some food, and I would really hope that you would stay around and uh, talk to our presenters. And also, in the spirit of interdisciplinary teams, meet someone that you don't recognize and tell them what college you're in and what kind of research you're in scholarly activities you're interested in. That's what research networking is all about and so this is a good way for us to launch that. So thank you and I'll see you over there where the adult beverages are. <laughs>